Hello, friends. Welcome to Coding Garden. Um, welcome to a YouTube code Q&A. So this is live only on YouTube. Um, get your questions in now, because there aren't that many people watching. So if you get your uh, questions in now, I will attempt to answer them. So uh, welcome in, everyone. Glad to have you. Unfortunately, you can't use the exclamation mark ask because we're over here on YouTube. But I will note your question down. So go ahead. Um, I'm going to say hi to everyone. And then as I see questions, I'm going to add them to uh, this little file here. And then in about 15 minutes, I'll start answering the questions that have been asked so far. <laughs> Don't know about Dozier? The heck is that? The heck is that? <clears throat> but uh, welcome in. Uh, this doesn't normally happen. Um, <laughs> I'm not normally live on YouTube, and I'm not normally wearing a dinosaur T-shirt. But today we're going to be working on Dino, Dino over on Twitch. Uh, no, no Twitch issue. Um, I'm just live an hour before I'm going to be live over on Twitch. Yeah, that's a good question. Look to when should you use static classes? Really, really, the answer is not just specific to Node.js. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. All right, let's say hi to everyone. Um, Usama, hello. Welcome in. What's up, uh, Aikok Tran, and uh, Mutahai, and Muhammad, and Hiroshi, and Nathan, and Tolga, and um, was it Nathan that had the Java interview? Good good luck on the inter interview, uh, Nathan. And what's up, Samuel from Nairobi? That's awesome. And TCG versus OCG. Hello, what's up, Kristen? And hello, um, Hill and Hiroshi from Japan. Very cool. Uh, what's up, MK and Walid and Swifty uh, and Samuel and Java Guy? Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, what's up, Aaron? Um, yeah, feel free to ask Aaron, and uh, I'll put it on the list. Well, I'm only going to be live here for like roughly forty-five, roughly for an hour, roughly fifty-five minutes. <laughs> So, uh, if it's a complicated question, I might not be able to get to it, but you can ask. Uh, what's up, Pepsalt? Hello, the Shivas. Thanks for being here. Uh, and yeah, I streamed for seven hours on Wednesday. It was too much. I should have only streamed for half of that. And Shane, hello, welcome in. What's up, Cesar? And uh, Shivas says, uh, "You're a DevSecOps engineer. Nice, nice." Yeah, I don't think we had too many issues with Docker, did we? Maybe we did. I don't know. <laughs> I think we spent a good hour and a half working on Docker stuff. What's up, Oscar and Ayad? Welcome in. Uh, thank you, Cesar, for the compliment. What's up, Mark Boots? On both YouTube and Twitch. Hello, Bytherial and Look2 and Kava and uh, Mutahai and Vidith and Tanvir. Welcome in. Welcome in. Thanks for the compliment, Shane. Shirt is fresh. Um, suggest good Golang MVC. I don't, I don't do, I haven't really done any Golang, so I don't have a good answer for that. Um, recover from last time. <laughs> yeah, I pretty much, like, yesterday was a pretty chill day, though I did a lot of cleaning around the house. I didn't work on my course like I should be, but, yeah. And Swifty has a question, um, what's your opinion on Astro? And... Where did that go? Is it not on here? There it is. What's your opinion on Astro and the concept of violence? It's pretty cool. Um, I'll maybe talk about it more. Maybe we can like spin up an app and like really talk about what uh, Astro is, because the kind of apps that I build don't necessarily fall into what you would you typically use Astro for. And what's up, Fred? Welcome in. And uh, Guru Paul, hello. Welcome in. Um, and Wire, hello. What's up, Adrian? Mihil says, I think I'm just going to use the YouTube side because it's easier for me to copy over here. Um, where are we at? How would you approach a PayPal-like checkout platform? I've talked about payments pretty recently. I can try to find that Q&A stream. But like, so I'm based in the, U in the United States, and Stripe is probably the best option for payments in the United States. Um, if you're not in the U.S., then it might be something else, but we'll, we'll talk about it. And uh, Rishikesh, welcome in. Uh, Oscar says, Dozier is like Django. Ooh, okay. We'll look into it. Yeah, I'll talk about my update, and thank you, uh, Mutai, for asking. <laughs> the update is, 
I I haven't been spending enough time on it. I've been working on other things. And Thanvir, hello, hello. Yeah, so red just is because uh, the chats are from YouTube, and I made this overlay a long time ago. Hello, Mark. Welcome in. Is it good to work with styled components? Um, I can give my quick opinion on that. Um, it all has to do with, like, preference, because it's really just a developer tool. There's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, Limitless is saying, Heroku free tier replacement. Um, I'll try to do a, a quick rundown of those, because we, we did talk about it, um, I think, maybe last Friday or the Friday before that. Aaron, hello. Uh, if you were uh, to dev a view app design and ran to ran ro locally by users, but you want to be able to push updates that the user can receive, how would you do that? I might have an answer for you. So basically, you're distributing an app that they're going to be running, but then you want to be able to push updates to all the users that have that app running locally, like new features, that kind of thing. And uh, Atramon, hello, welcome. What's up, Byte Pusher? And uh, Deep says, what kind of developer do I see myself? Back end, front end, full stack. I consider myself a software developer. I'm a software developer that builds software with web technologies. Uh, uh, you'd probably call me a full stack developer, but um, I see I see a lot of uh, tutorials and such about like web dev, it, like front end web dev, like serious CSS stuff and design stuff. I don't do a lot of that. I just I build applications. I, I write software. I don't know. We'll talk about it a little bit more. And thank you, Oscar. Welcome in. What's up, Usama? Rushikesh says, uh, I'm a lifesaver for TypeScript. Recently joined whatever project. Nice. Glad to hear it. I know like those those TypeScript videos that I've done are doing really well, uh, which just means there is a desire to learn TypeScript. There's a lot of people out there that want to learn TypeScript. Uh, and Etramon says, Docker is an issue on its own. Most of the time, Docker behaves, but yeah. But, uh, Aaron has a question. OK. Assuming users are not tech savvy, um, this is in regards to how to do this. OK. And another question from Amutahai. You're an experienced developer. What's your way of advice for those who are starting new, like a roadmap? I kind of want to create a roadmap. Um, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> Pulsar says, uh, what to start with? Also, it varies. <laughs> What's up, Hector? <laughs> feel, feel weird without a nickname? You actually can talk over on Twitch, and I'll, I'll still see the messages if you talk on Twitch. What's up, Bob? Welcome in. Um, and Nathan says, what's a good project that Astro would fit well with? Yeah, so I'll talk about that when I talk about, like, what do I think of Astro. But essentially, um, if you were using, uh, like, uh, tools like Gatsby JS or Gridsome, essentially static content, but you were using front-end frameworks to build out that static content, that's what Astro is really for. They can do server-side rendering, and uh, they can work on a back-end, but they're really meant for static site generation. Yeah, we haven't done coding, coding improv in a while. We probably will. It's just I've been doing less streams. Um, uh, because I want to work on my course, but then I haven't been working on my course. I don't know. <laughs> Ayata's saying, how long does it? Uh, how long will it take to be able to learn dev, uh, develop Server Express app and React app? And I'm boot camp right now. I feel like I'm almost lost after two months. It varies. Like It's not easy to answer this question, because it is different for everyone. Um, uh, but I'll talk about it in in context of like I used to teach at a coding boot camp, but that coding boot camp was a six month long program. I know coding boot camps uh, these days are uh, less than that, maybe a little bit more. But yeah, all right. I think that's all we're gonna have time to talk about. I'll at least read through these other ones, but pretty quickly, and then we'll start answering questions. Um, in your video, you start every project on scratch. Does it make sense to create templates in a custom component library? Yeah, absolutely. And like recently, the stuff that I did with TypeScript, both of those things really are kind of like starter templates for apps, which is why I created them. Because you can see my, my most recent YouTube video, uh, even edited down, that was over an hour of me just setting up uh, a React app with TypeScript and ESLint and all this developer tooling that I typically like to use, and I don't want to have to do that every time I spin up an app. So pretty much that is that is my it is, that is my starter template, um, and uh, I 
if you look at the longer live stream for when I, whenever I was actually working on this thing, I spent an hour looking for existing starter projects or existing boilerplates. And they had way too much. Like, I, I want this, I want a developer setup, but I don't want someone to choose my styling solution. I don't want them to choose, like, how I talk to APIs. All of those things are going to be specific to every project. So this starter project is, like, everything you need and only the things you need, not anything extra. And then once you pull it down, then you would decide on, like, a component library or a CSS library or something like that. But, yeah, I, I, I am going to use that as my um, starter. Uh, hot take on Tailwind and state management. So those are two different things, but I will talk about Tailwind because uh, Tailwind came up uh, quite a bit on the last stream where I was choosing a component library. Yeah. And what's up, Marnix? Is Nest a good framework for building APIs? I think so. We can talk about alternatives if we get to it. But that's it. No more questions. And um, Byron, what do I think about Dino and Node? Dino is on its way. Like Dino has been around long enough and has had enough people working on it as in, and is in production that eventually, and they're also um, striving to make it completely backwards compatible with all Node apps. So Dino has a very bright feature, future in that at some point it will be possible to take your existing Node.js app and just run it through Dino instead um, with very little work, if any. So it's on its way. But not GitHub. The users are not tech savvy. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, when I when I answer your question, I'll ask you a few more clarifying things. Uh, David is saying, like an Electron app that you can set up with auto updates. I think so. And like there are some frameworks that let you do that, where they essentially replace the entire web code that's running for the Electron app. Like they download it, replace it internally. I mean, that's basically what Discord does, because Discord is an Electron app, and whenever it runs an update, it just pulls web resources to a specific directory, restarts the app, and then uses those. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, TypeScript is great, but it really slows you down. I feel like TypeScript errors don't tell you what the act issue actually is. Yeah, I think uh, there is a learning curve with TypeScript to kind of just like, first of all, figure out the errors, but also reach a point where you understand what TypeScript is doing for you and know when to turn it off. Like, know when it's worth your time to even deal with those errors. Because you could pretty much ignore every TypeScript error and have a somewhat working app. <laughs> you just you just might run into some type issues. Yeah, like a data structures and algorithms uh, roadmap. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, in my career as a software developer that uses web technologies to build software, um, I have barely used, it any, if any, data structures and algorithms. Um, it will help with interviews depending on the company you go to, but yeah. 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 Oh, thank you, Aaron. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, breeze through these um, chats and then we're gonna start answering questions. Is Django the best for enterprise level applications? Uh, if if your devs write Python, that's probably the way to go. But I don't I don't write Python, or I mean I have before, but I don't write now. <laughs> What's up, Rambo? Uh, yeah, you're welcome, Matrix. Yeah, it's it is a weird week, isn't it? <laughs> Mihail says uh, amendment for the question. Don't know. An external checkout platform. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, probably something like Shopify. Um, and there are other things that are similar, but we can talk about that. L learn or learn by doing? I have always learned by doing my entire life. Before I, Even before I went to college, I've always just learned by doing things. That's always been my style. And that fits really well with the world of web development because that's kind of what it takes. Yeah. Uh, I haven't heard of Plop.js. Cool. Yeah, I mean, back in the day, there was Yeoman or Yeoman which is a uh, project scaffolding tool. I feel like some things still use Yeoman, but it's a little bit out of style to use Yeoman. You can basically like create project generators with it. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Mihail. Glad, glad to hear it. Yeah, welcome in, Avi. We're on YouTube. <laughs> uh, what cloud do you use? AWS, Google, or Azure? Uh, they all do very similar things. So uh, whichever one... I mean, honestly, like if you're if you're looking to use something to get job experience, it really pays to have like AWS experience or AWS certifications on your resume. I mean, probably like if you have Google Cloud Compute certifications. Honestly, it doesn't matter. Just pick one. <laughs> and also, you could think about uh, which one has the best free tier if you're trying to choose for that. But if you're trying to choose for your business, go with the one that's going to be the cheapest. Like, use their cost calculators. How do you get over imposter syndrome? 
um, just remember that no one really has any idea what they're doing. No one. They think they do. They act like they do. Some, the only difference is that some people are really good at hiding the fact that they don't know what they're doing, and some people are really good at pretending to be, or really good at being confident, even though they actually don't know what they do, they're doing. Uh, so once you realize that everybody's just faking it, uh, it's easy to just, you know, do your best. <laughs> Absolutely no one knows what they're doing yet. It's really funny. There, there's been some, some posts, like, on, on uh, Reddit lately. Or I forget where I read it, but it was, like, a, a Google engineer that was, like, oh, no, actually, this was, like, in my... I, I, so I went camping recently, and I was talking to some people, but a guy that was there knows someone that works at Google, and he echoed the sentiment. He was like, even here at Google, nobody knows what they're... Like, there's all these people that they're just collecting a paycheck. I mean, they're, they're trying, but even, even the code here is bad or doesn't have the best architecture. So, like, <laughs> just try your best. Do your best. So here's the thing. If you're always striving to do your best, you will outpace a lot of people because a lot of people are just there to collect a paycheck. And so if you're always trying your best... What more can you ask for, right? What, what, what more can you do? <laughs> Welcome in, Mucha. Oh, we're going to answer some questions now. Okay, so um, I missed a lot of chats, but we're just going to go ahead and start answering questions because uh, we don't have much time left. And Senpai asked about thoughts on TRPC. Um, that's related to someone that asked about, yeah, what's a good, uh, this one. It's related to this question. So we'll try to get to that. But here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> Rambo says, how to build logic with React and Node. I'm stuck with tutorials. Actually, I'll talk about this. Um, here, and actually, let's let's uh, let's start here, because uh, I mean, I I am a a YouTuber that somewhat makes tutorials. The the thing is, my my tutorials are like fair fairly different than um, than a lot because I try to show the whole process. Most tutorials you see are. Uh, very polished because the person already built that thing before and they're just like rebuilding it on camera uh, and it's edited down to take out all the mistakes so it, it makes it seem um, it makes it seem uh, like they actually know what they're doing and then you just follow exactly what they're doing and now you have a working app but you didn't get to go through all of the troubleshooting and everything that they did when they were building the app initially um, I would take for example my some of my more recent videos um, so if you look at even build a credit, so build a crud API, edited down, this was an hour and a half. But if you look over on the archive channel, um, which posts full live streams, here, look on the archive channel. So this is an hour and a half. It was edited down. And then um, if you look over here, it was three hours long, not edited down. So it took me three hours to build and also teach about that same app. And also, this wasn't the first time I did it. So before I did this live stream, I actually built it myself, not streaming, to make sure I knew all the parts and pieces. And then I did it again on stream, and then I edited it down. So like, when you're watching tutorials, you're see you're not seeing the whole process. Like, if you really want to see the whole process, you could watch this. But, I, but what I'm also saying is that's not even the whole process, because I actually coded it before I even taught it. So I already had practice with it. Um, so uh, my advice is uh, don't follow tutorials exactly. So first piece of advice is um, don't follow tutorials uh, like exactly. Meaning don't just type the exact same code that the person doing the tutorial is doing. Um, because when you do that, you're, I mean, you might actually, like, you might get the thing working because you're copying exactly what they wrote, but like I said earlier, you're, you're not going through all the steps that they went to to actually learn that thing, and, and they had to, like, debug to get there and stuff like that. So, uh, what do you do if you're not following the tutorials exactly? You use the, tor use the tutorials as a, um, uh, like, a, a blueprint slash a guide, but then do your own thing with it. Um, which means, and <laughs> um, let's take for example, like, and you may not be into backend development. I'm going to uh, edit a video pretty recently that's about building a React app, so you can take into account there. But for example, this build a CRUD API with TypeScript and Express. If you watch this video, and instead of just copying the code that I write, you think about how 
the code I'm writing could solve your problem. And then you try to build your own API to solve that specific problem. Um, you're essentially now, now you're out of tutorial hell because you're building your own thing based on something that, that I that I actually built. Um, so for example, like this is an API to do uh, create, read, update, and delete uh, to dos. Um, let's look at. Uh, I'll show you the code really quick to tell you what I'm talking about. So if you watch that and you code it exactly like like I do, you're going to end up with this piece of code right here. But if you watch it, try to take in the concepts, not just copy exactly what I'm doing, you could take this API and, and build whatever API you want. So like, if you look in the source code, there's an API directory, and then there's a to-dos folder. You could follow this structure and build an API that does anything. So instead of to-dos, it could be a list of your favorite uh, recipes, or instead of to-dos, it could be a list of your favorite beers, or it could be all the movies that you've watched, or it could be um, places that you visited, or it could be, oh no, this is live. We're, we're live right now, Zany. <laughs> um, it, could be, it could be a lot of things. So basically what I'm telling you is, is take what you see in a tutorial and then extrapolate it to your own problem. And specifically here, you could take these as an example, but then just rework them for the thing that you're trying to do. So um, the routes would probably be the same. What would be different is how you specify your validators. And if you look in the model here, um, I teach uh, how to use this library called za to do validation. And this model is very basic. It just has two properties. But now if you watch this tutorial and you learn about Zod, you could try to make your own schema for, let's say, um, restaurants, right? And so think about all the, the aspects of a restaurant. They have uh, a location, they have a name, um, they have a description. So instead of just two properties, you have a lot more properties and then you can expand from there. And then when you're actually building out the API endpoints, um, it's not just a, I mean, it'll actually be very similar to this, but instead of to-dos, it'll be restaurants. So um, I don't know if that was the best example, but really that's how you get out of tutorial hell is stop copying exactly what the tutorial is doing take what they've taught you and apply it to your own problem. That's really how you're going to learn is by doing your own thing. <laughs> Glad to hear it, Ashish. I'll get you motivated. So ho hopefully, hopefully that helps, Rambo. Basically, like you could still watch tutorials, but don't do exactly what they're telling you to do. D apply it to your own problems. Cool. It's the show before the show. All right, let's, let's answer another question. Uh, this question comes from Shane. Um, if I'm implementing OpenID sign-on, with Steam, I would need to use it on the front end with a router rather than my back end to store or persist the session, right? You would always need to do it with both. So the thing about, I mean, technically with OAuth, there is a, a thing called client side flow. And I don't know if um, Steam, do they have OAuth 2? Do they support that? Oh, not, not stream, Steam. You mean like the gaming platform, right? Steam. OAuth, Steamworks documentation. Is this it? And we're talking to Shane AGM right now. Is this is this what you're trying to implement? Um, it's open ID only. Cool. Um, so, uh, typically. When you're dealing with OAuth, you actually do want a, um, a, a backend to store that user information as well, because the application that you're building has its own things and needs to deal with uh, users itself. So um, what you, and it really depends on what you're building, but like, let's say um, you're building an app that lets people manage their game library. I mean, obviously, that doesn't make as much sense because Steam is a game library. But let's say you're making an app that lets people uh, keep track of all the Steam games that they've played. Um, you, when the user logs in, you need to store that user in your own database because you're going to be storing information about the user. Like, you're going to be storing all the games that they own, all the games that they want to buy, maybe reviews about games. And so all of that information about that specific user needs to be tied to a user and that user needs to be in your database as well. So typically what you do with OAuth is when a user signs in, you uh, either insert or update a user in your own database and you keep track of their specific um, OAuth ID, in this case, the ID from, coming from Steam. Let's take a, a quick stretch. Um, 
And so now in your database, you have a unique user, but then you also have another property on there that's called like Steam ID. Um, and so uh, when a user does a specific thing and they need to like, like add, a, add a favorite or something like that, um, you need to associate it with that specific user. So typically what you do is you have your own backend, your own auth system. It's just when they log in, you keep track of who they are. So that, uh, and you also potentially keep track of their refresh token. So if you need to make requests to Steam on their behalf, like get a list of all the games that they've bought, um, you have that token that you can use to make those requests. And those requests are happening on the back end. But it, it really dep it depends on the kind of app that you're building because if you don't have a database and this is all just like its own front end to Steam, then you technically, if, if they off offer client side flow, which means you don't actually need a back end, you can, because uh, for example, Twitch OAuth has client side flow, meaning you don't need a back end. You can do the flow, uh, it redirects back to the client side and um, you actually get a token that you can use on that user's behalf. And uh, from there, you could like store that, let's say like in local storage or something like that. And then anytime they come to your page, you use that token to make requests to Steam. If it supports that, I mean, I would assume that even like the Steam API probably doesn't support uh, cores, which means you'd have to create your own backend anyways. I don't know. It really depends. Hopefully that clears a few things up and you have more, some, more stuff to look into, but um, usually you want a custom backend. Am I planning on do, to deploy the Express backend to AWS? I'm pro I probably, maybe? I, I, I probably would deploy, deploy it to something like Railway, or maybe I would try Fly.io or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, thanks, Java guy. Cool. I missed a lot of chats. Well, welcome in, uh, Zero X Gamer. Yeah. Welcome in. Yeah, 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 you're welcome, Shane. Um, how important is it to learn design patterns? You've already asked a question, I think. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, already, I'm only answering the questions that I've already, I already picked up because we're not going to be here for much longer. Um, yeah, so I'm just live on, on, on YouTube before the Twitch show. So in like 40 minutes, I'm going to be live over on Twitch. All right, next question comes from Oscar, who says, do I know about Dozier? Dozier? Never heard of it. Um, somebody mentioned it was a Python thing. REST implementation of Django authentication system? Is this it? I don't, I don't really do much Python, so I've never heard of it. <laughs> so if you want to clarify, Oscar, whoa, what, 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 is, what is Dozier in relation to? And yeah, Rambo, I've, I've done Node.js tutorials. More recently, I did one on Node.js with TypeScript. Um, so you can check that out here. But if you search my channel for Node.js, I've done a lot of stuff with, uh, with Node.js. Um, let's search for Node. And really, I mean, if you search for Express, that's, that's probably closer because pretty much any time I'm dealing with Node, I deal with Express. Yeah. Um, OK, yeah. So if you're still here, Oscar, you can, you can clarify about Dozier. All right, look to question has a question. When should you use static classes in Node.js? So this is more of a uh, like OOP um, thing. So. Like, let's say, um, yeah, I think like the, the answer is like, it makes a lot of sense to have a static class if it is almost like a, a singleton. So the best case is like singletons make sense. Uh, and if you don't know what a singleton is, it is one single instance for the entire app. And uh, what, what the, there is like a singleton pattern where you can just have like a regular plain old class. Like let's say we have a, a configuration class um, and that has things like, I don't know, I'm gonna come up with a bunch of things, base URL. <laughs> um, throw, throw possible configuration things in the chat and I'll put them in this thing. Um, local host, 9,000. Uh, we also have a configuration for like max retries. I'm again, random random stuff that we would want as configuration. Um, yeah, I mean, so we have like base URL. Yeah, like uh, let's say like API key. <laughs> and Mark is kappaing because uh, I I've, I uh, expose my Discord secret a lot on the Dino stream. 
That's another one. Yeah. Oh, maybe like a default or let's say like admin username. Um, so I, I don't know. You get the idea. So basically, this is something that might be used through, throughout your application. And it has all of these values that are needed in various places throughout your application. Um, but it does make sense. Can you do this in, can you do this in JavaScript? I guess these would need to be static properties. Um, JavaScript static class. Yeah, I think they would just be static properties in this case. Yeah, so you actually wouldn't do it like that. You would put it put it here. Cool. But then we don't really need a class, right? We could just use an object. Sure, but like if you're following object-oriented programming and like everything else in your app is like a class anyways, then you could do something like this because what this now allows you allows you to do is to use it. So like you have a function do the thing, and um, in this case, it needs to, let's say, it, make, it needs to make a fetch to the base API, uh, base URL. In this case, you can say conf capital configuration um, dot, and then you get access to those specific keys. And like, let's say we say like base URL. So in this case, anywhere in your app where you need these values, because they're static, you can just, you can just use them like that. Um, the other way to do this is instead of having static properties, um, let's call this a static configuration. So instead of having a static properties, you just have a singleton instance. Um, and we'll call this uh, singleton configuration. And so these are no longer static. These are actual properties. But then you have some sort of static property called instance that's equal to um, a new singleton configuration like this. And then um, when you need an instance of the constructor, I believe, or you could have like a static method called like get instance and it returns underscore instance, something like that. So there's various ways to do it. But now you can see that we're actually using class properties. Like it's actually creating an instance of this class. And then now if we wanted to use it, we would say fetch uh, configuration, uh, singleton configuration dot uh, get, or actually we could, we could actually just call this like instance. Um, and then how do you do a how do you do a getter like that? Yeah, like that. Um, so now you can do singleton configuration dot instance dot uh, base URL. Is this how you do uh, getters <laughs> in classes? JavaScript class getter. Yeah, get. That should be it. Does this look right for anybody that, that knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> like, you have an ins. I mean, really, you could do something like you start this off as uh, null, and then you could say like if underscore instance or like uh, you have a static property called instance, and if uh, instance um, uh, is null, then you create an instance of it. Yeah, good call tone. I think this fixes it because now instance is a static property. I mean, you also could like make it private like this. Um, and then the outside world can't access um, instance. They only can do the getter and the getter returns um, that, that uh, uh, property, yeah, and so now I should actually get uh, autocomplete. So if I say dot instance, then we should see. Eh, it doesn't even know that base URL is a thing though. <sighs> oh, 
but yeah, you're right, Aunt Main. That should have been static, but now I made it private. <laughs> We're getting into OOP stuff, but like these are two different ways to do it. You have a bunch of static properties, or you could have non-static properties and then just a single instance. So anytime someone tries to access the instance, you just return that one instance that you only created once. Um, and so uh, when should you use them? Really, if you have stuff that doesn't change that often and needs to be used throughout your app. Hopefully that helped. Hopefully that helped. All right, uh, Swifty is asking, what's your opinion on Astro and the concept of, of islands? Let's talk about it. Um, should be the name of the class instead of this? Oh, uh, I think this is a newer JavaScript feature. So because I'm inside of, inside of a static uh, getter, this refers to the, uh, I think that's really just a shorthand for um, uh, the static property like that. <laughs> and I think this code would actually work the same way. Um, so yeah. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, return singleton configuration. Oh, and that, that might get me type completion, but hopefully that helped a little bit. All right, Swifty asked, what's my opinion on Astro and the concept of islands? So, uh, Astro is it was released pretty recently. I think like less than a month ago they had their their major release. And um, yeah, I mean, really, if you look, if you if you start reading about Astro, you can see like the very first line. It's a web framework for building fast, content focused websites. Uh, that, there's, that, that that accounts for a lot of things. So content focused means. Uh, like a blog or an informational website or like a, a product landing page um, uh, or like a, a wiki that doesn't maybe for your organization that doesn't change that often. So like uh, things based on like articles or, or like really static content, right? And if you think about when you're building uh, like web apps with React or Vue or whatever else, they're typically not content focused. They're typically very dynamic in that um, and I guess that's an, that's another thing to think about, right? So if you have a an app where when one user logs in, they see something different than when some other user logs in, that is not a good use case for Astro because Astro is all about content, uh, content that every person using the website is going to see the exact same. You probably could do some sort of login and have like a login state in the nav bar, but at that point you're building more of a an application than you are of like static content. And Astro is really good for building static content. So um, if you've heard of things like Gatsby JS, which has fallen out of favor, like less and less people are using it, um, but Gatsby solves a very similar problem. Uh, Gridsum um, is the view version of that. Um, but if you've heard of like Jamstack or site generators, like Astro is basic is Jamstack. It's all about building like completely static stuff. Um, maybe even yeah, even Hugo. Um, so Astro is comparable to all of these other things. And so if you're building a site that is content focused, so think about a blog or uh, like a product launch page, something that's not dynamic, then that's what you would use Astro for. Um, and if you need to build a site like that, Astro seems kind of like the way to go. Um, so you're asking, like, what's my opinion on it? Um, what's really cool about Astro is you can use whatever front end framework uh, you want. So uh, they built it in a way that you have this static site generation, but then you can choose React or Preact or Svelte or Vue or Solid or Alpine. And so each of your components that you're building out, you can choose the language that you want to use, and, and they handle all of the static generation stuff behind the, uh, for you. Um, so if, if you find the need to reach for like Gatsby or Gridsome or Hugo or any of these other tools, you might reach for Astro instead. That said, if you do need some sort of interactivity um, in, in, your, in your app that you're building, um, that is where the idea of islands come into play because islands um, are essentially one tiny section of your app that actually is interactive and actually does have JavaScript. And for static websites, you might still have that. Like you might have, um, like I mean, I think the the Astro homepage is probably even an example of that. Like this here might be an island. Uh, it also probably doesn't have to be. It could be could be static content as well. Uh, let's take a quick stretch. Yeah. 
Astro says everything is rendered in JavaScript and not anymore with plain HTML and CSS. Uh, they're talking about how you write your code. So you're, you're not writing just plain HTML code anymore. You're, so uh, think of it like this. Um, Astro gives you all, all, the, all the benefits of, of like building out a static site, but using modern JavaScript tooling. So using the modern tool set the developers are used to. Um, so if you already know React or you already know Vue, you can take that, start building out content or static sites and not really have to learn m many new things, if any. Yeah. Um, but l let it be known, Astro, at the end of the day, is going to generate static content. So like whatever you write, whether it's React or Svelte or Vue, it is going to generate HTML and CSS. That's it. Unless you have islands. And islands can be like one little tiny section right here that actually does use some JavaScript. And that little section right there will ship JavaScript to the browser. Um, it will still be like compiled down to like HTML and CSS, but there, there will be JavaScript associated with that one little section. Everything else, completely static HTML and CSS. Um, so yeah, and the, you, you might also think about, um, or like the other question is like, well, what if I do want to use Astro to build apps? And um, they do support server-side rendering. And so, so typically the flow with something like Astro or any one, any, other, any one of these other tools is when you deploy your site, you are deploying HTML and CSS files. You are not deploying a Node.js server. Let me say it again. When you deploy, when when you're done writing your Astro app, when you build it, it's just HTML and CSS and maybe a little bit of JavaScript. It is not Node.js. It does not require a backend process unless you want to do server-side rendering. Because with server-side rendering, you need a backend process that can dynamically render things based on the incoming request. Um, so yeah, this is saying if you want to have things like login state, you would use server-side rendering. Um, if you want to render things uh, dynamically, you could use server-side rendering. Now, it's possible that like eventually this could be the replace. Like instead of using something like Next.js, you would use Astro with server-side rendering. Um, but I've even heard like the creators of Astro talk about like Astro isn't meant to be a server-side rendering framework. Like if you need that, use something like Next.js or Next uh, Next.js. Um, but you technically can do it with Astro as well. All right, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, you could create an island that has some JavaScript, but uh, what they were saying is that like if you really wanted login, then you probably want to do server-side rendering anyways, because if you're doing login, you probably have a custom backend. I mean, technically, if you built that backend as an API, you could write Astro islands that talk to that API, um, but yeah, it varies. Okay, so thanks for your question. Let's keep going. Um, Mihil is asking, how would you approach a payment-like checkout platform? I have some things in mind, but love your thoughts. Um, external checkout platform to integrate with something else, not specifically payments and stuff. Yeah, so I mean, um, I think of uh, Shopify. That's one of the most popular ones. Um, and it lets you, I believe you can you can create a store and like upload your products and stuff like that, but they also have plugins that will manage like automatically generating shipping labels and different stuff like that. I don't know um, what, where you can use it. Or I, like, I know this is really popular in the United States. I don't know if other countries it's popular there as well. Uh, there's also WooCommerce, um, which is a thing. And then if you search for like open source Shopify alternative, you could probably find some things. There was a there was one um, released recently. Oh, I think I tried using 30Bs. Um, but there was one released recently. Is it Presta? Um, Medusa, is that the one? Yeah, the open source Shopify alternative. I would say, like, as far as I know, Medusa is still early days, so there's, like, a lot of things you can do with Shopify that you can't necessarily do with Medusa yet. Like, let's see if I can find in their documentation how to handle, like, shipping labels. Um, shipping address, shipping label. Yeah, uh, plugins that calculate shipping rates could create, yeah. Shipping options are configured for each region. Well, maybe they have it built in now. Like there was at one point I was looking it into it and they didn't really have this stuff implemented yet. Um, 
And then let's look at 30 bees, because I, I think I did try to set up an instance of 30 bees at one point. Um, and then, yeah. Okay, so this question went, was asked by Mihil. Does this answer your question? You also mentioned that there were some other things you had in mind. Is this in line with what you had in mind? Because the idea is you could spin up one of these shops, whether, like, if so if you're using uh, Medusa or 30Bs or even, I think, even Presta, uh, you can put it on your own server and, like, configure it there. Um, and I think WooCommerce you can actually have as a plugin to, like, a WordPress app, and then Shopify, they host it for you and you're paying like a monthly fee to them. But once you have all of that set up, then you can add products, set prices, uh, set weights for thing, and then automatically generate uh, shipping labels based on the weight of everything that they checked out with. Yeah, I would say don't don't build it yourself. <laughs> I mean, if anything, like use one of the open source ones and maybe like fork it if you want to add stuff. But typically these have plugin APIs. So uh, if there's specific things that you need to do, um, you could use this and then write your own plugins to do the more specific things that you want to do. But uh, managing all of that stuff is really hard and would take a lot of code to do it yourself. So I would say d don't. <laughs> um, but if you really have to, use these as an example. Like see, see what they provide, see how they're structured, um, and then go from there. OK, I'm going to keep moving. Uh, Moon Tahai has asked, what's the update of the course? Are you planning to create a beginner tutorial, tutorial for free? Uh, the plan is that I'm, I'm working on it. So I'm calling it uh, Full Stack 101. Um, and the idea is this is uh, a high level overview of the, put it in quotes, full stack. Uh, because the term full stack th these days, I mean, and it almost always has been, it's pretty, pretty overloaded. Like, what do you mean by full stack? Um, what I mean is uh, web applications that include so applications built with web technologies that include front ends, back ends, and databases, which is how most modern applications are built. And my goal with the course is to teach you about all the parts and, parts and pieces. Um, so the outline uh, has things like uh, how, uh, or like um, the internet and uh, the World Wide Web. So I teach you what the internet is, how it works, how the World Wide Web is built on top of the internet, and then all of the particular things that you need to care about if you're building applications with web technologies, like HTTP, the request response cycle, that kind of thing. Um, I then also want to talk about like developer tooling. So like the basic usage of a terminal, the basic, basic usage of a code editor. So you know how the web works, learn how to use these tools, and then also like uh, Git and GitHub use these tools to build websites that work on that, um, and then actually implement a front end. So like the basics of HTML, uh, CSS, and uh, really like DOM manipulation. Um, and then also how to deal with backend. So things like uh, web APIs, uh, databases, um, that kind of thing. And then um, how it all fits together, and then also talk about like deployment. So like you built the thing, how do you put it on the web for for other people to use? Um, that's that's the plan for the course, and yeah, so it's kind of like beginner to advanced, but also it's also like very high level in that this is not going to be the last course you ever need. Like if you look at Udemy, um, there are some really popular. Uh, they call it like uh, yeah, full stack boot camps. Um, the one from Colt Steel, yeah, this is probably one of the most popular ones. It has over 800,000 students. Um, this, I believe, has like over 60 hours of video content. And it's meant to be kind of like a full course in that you take this and then you could potentially be hireable after taking this course. That is not my goal with it. My goal is like this won't be, I'm try, I don't want to make it any longer than 10 hours. Um, but it, it, I wanted to give you an, an idea of the landscape so that then you can go pick and choose the things that you want to focus on, like whether you want to focus on front end or back end. Um, I really want to like show you the lay of the land, give you a really good mental model for how these things work, and then it's up to you to like to dive deeper and learn more about these topics. That's my idea anyways. The issue that I'm running into is that it, it is a lot of topics to cover, especially if I want it to only be... Um, uh, like less than 10 hours of content. Um, yeah, and the idea is like, so there, there are a lot of students that graduate from coding boot camps that technically did full stack that still don't have a good understanding of like in the difference 
and understand the difference between the front end and the back end, or even understand the HTTP request response cycle. So my idea is that like you could have gone through a coding boot camp. It could have been like a whirlwind tour. But then if you watch this course, it'll give you perspective on all the stuff that you learned and give you a better idea of how it all fits together. Um, so that's my plan. Um, I will probably release like the first few lessons for free on YouTube, like probably the internet and the World Wide Web, and um, maybe even uh, Terminal and, and GitHub. I'll release those for free on YouTube, but then uh, I'll basically say, if you want to watch the rest, then you'll have to get it on Udemy. That's, that's another thing that I want to focus on is um, like concepts, not implementation. Because uh, we're going to build a backend using JavaScript, likely, because that's, I mean, it's the easiest, especially if you're learning those same, um, same things for the front end. But I will teach it in a way that teaches you what you're actually doing, because you can take those concepts and then implement the same thing with Java or Python or C Sharp um, or any other backend langu uh, language. Implementation. And so the whole course focuses on, like, these are the concepts that you're going to use in your career. I'm going to show you one way to do it, but think about the concepts, not necessarily about the implementation, meaning you can take what you learn here and, and, and apply it from other things. All right, we're running low on time. Um, let's answer one more thing before I go. Uh, Heroku free tier replacement. I will point you to a stream that I did um, last week, maybe? Um, Oh, maybe I think it was two weeks ago. Let's talk about memes. Yeah, so if you watch this video, um, I actually just pointed to some, <laughs> some tweets by uh, Medu Dev, uh, who's a streamer over on Twitch. Um, but I talk about some of the alternatives that he mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mark, for that. That's the. Um, I'll share this on the on the YouTube chat as well. Um, basically, in that video, I talk about this and then add links to stuff. So yeah, check that out as well. So if you're looking for a, uh, an alternative to Heroku, check that video. Check that link. That'll that'll give you more info. And let's try to answer this really quick. I mean, I kind of only have like a minute or two to try and answer this one. Um, but let's see. So Aaron is asking, uh, if you were to develop a Vue app designed to be ran locally by users, but you want to be able to push updates to that user, what would you do? Um, so if it needs to be run locally, then you're, think you're probably going to be building an Electron app, right? Um, or some kind of desktop wrapper around a Vue app. Is that, is that what you're thinking, Aaron? Like you want to distribute it to these non-technical users as an app that's running on their desktop? Um, If you are, then this is what you can look into. So Electron specifically has an API called Auto Updater, where essentially you can write your app in a way that it is packaged as basically a zip file with your Vue.js app inside of it. And then if you want to make an, an update, um, you, you'll need you'll you will need an update server for this. But like on the update server, you can say a new version is available, and then the Electron app, anytime it starts up, we'll check to see is there a new ver version. If it is, behind the scenes, it downloads a zip file, replaces or removes the current one, and then the app restarts, and then now you have the latest features and the latest versions of it. Um, the other thing you could do is you could write an Electron app that doesn't actually have the bundled. Um, uh, 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 source code, like it doesn't have the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript embedded in it. It actually just points to a website. And then anytime you need to update it, you just update the website. So the next time they launch the Electron app, they're using the latest website because that's what it loads anyways. But that's I think that's what you should look into, and that's probably close, closest to what you want. Like you want to build an app with Electron that uses Vue internally, distribute it to your users, and then you have a way of giving them the latest features, uh, either through auto updates or the fact that the app just loads um, the latest stuff from the web. Does that help? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, and then I think Electron Builder is like a completely separate project, but they also have like auto update. 
Um, you might be able to look into uh, Electron Auto Update Server. You can see what's out there for that. What is Quick Margo? Yeah, and then so uh, Tari is a potential option, but um, if you're dealing with uh, native file system access or other like native things, then you will uh, need to learn their API. So if you look into their API, the JavaScript API, uh, it has things like the the F, like FS or file system or making HTTP requests. The cool thing about this is you write JavaScript code using this API. Under the hood, it's happening natively with Rust. But I will say if you're used to Node.js, then uh, there's a bit of a learning curve because you have to learn how to do file system access with this and HTTP. Whereas if you're using Electron, all of your native stuff is pure Node.js, so you can use what you know. Yeah. If it was for install on a Pi or home server and not a desktop app, it would be interesting to know how you'd do it. I mean, at the end of the day, like websites are auto updated. <laughs> like, like when you go to this website in your web browser, you're getting the latest version. So um, if you just host it somewhere, and then when people go to it, um, they ha they now have the latest version. That's just a website. The issue is if you want to do native things on the user's device, that's when you need something like Electron. Um, and I mean, specific you specifically said you wanted to have a view app, which that's what led me to say something like Electron. But yeah. OK, uh, I have to go. Thank you for all your questions. Um, I didn't have time to answer all of them. But oh, I will also say, yeah, so uh, Muntahi asked, uh, what is my advice for starting new, like a roadmap? I want I want to create one. So like right now, uh, roadmap.sh is probably the probably the most popular roadmap that's out there. Like they have front end, they have back end. I think they even spe yeah they specifically have like a note. Like they're they're creating roadmaps for all this stuff. Um, and on the surface, it seems pretty cool. But the I believe the issue is, you have this roadmap. Now what do you do with it. Like it gives you the topics and you could like click in and they do have a little bit of information and they kind of like link out to uh, like external content. But what I want to do is I want to create my own like roadmap. I'm not gonna even going to call it a roadmap. Um, I'll come up with a name for it, but I want to create something similar. But every little node here will have a tutorial by me explaining how to do that thing and also external resources, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, because I have a, a, a lot of a lot of experience with teaching and teaching concepts like standards and objectives and like mastery based learning, I want to incorporate all of that as well. So almost like this roadmap would also be like your um, specifically what you use in your learning path. And so like I wouldn't have a node here for intro to JavaScript. I would literally have a node for uh, variables and types. And then another node for functions, and so like real, like really, really break it down. Like you can see, yeah, they have variable declarations, um, but I would also word it in a way that it it is uh, attainable by the learner, not just like understand variables. More specifically, like use variables to uh, declare uh, number types or something like that. I don't know, but I'd have to come up with all of that. So that that's my idea. Is like I want to create something like this, but much more education focused and then also it'll be an app that you can log into and like keep track of your progress like on a roadmap that's what i want to do uh i don't have a roadmap right now <laughs> I, would, I would like to create one uh and what to start with view versus react versus angular uh if you're specifically looking to find a job look at the job post in your area and um learn based on that. If you're just looking to learn because you want to build something for yourself, I always recommend Vue. It has the lowest learning curve uh, and is just really nice to work with. Depending on where you are, React is typically the most popular for jobs. Uh, if you're in like the enterprise world or like larger corporations, they typically use things like Angular. But if I had to choose and I was building it for myself, I would just choose Vue. Okay, I gotta go. Thank you for all the questions. That was fun. Um, I will be live on Twitch in 10 minutes. Yeah, so head over to twitch.tv slash coding garden. Uh, in 10 minutes, uh, I'm going to be live over there. And we're going to be working on Dino, which is an alternative. Well, not I mean, not, not Dino itself. We're going to be working on an app um, that uh, runs inside of Dino. We've been working on it for uh, a few weeks now, and it uses a framework called Fresh. So Fresh is a framework 
somewhat similar to like Next.js, but also different in that it like it's server side rendering first, and it also has the concept of islands. Um, but we're using this framework, and ultimately we're building an app called Fresh Spots. Right now, it's super basic. It actually doesn't have any, yeah, it doesn't have any uh, functionality. Uh, except for login, but we're going to be working on functionality today. And also some bugs, because uh, you can log in. Um, wait, I thought I logged in. Oh, I'll have to change that. Um, but yeah, you can log in, and then you can log out. That's the only feature. Um, but Hopefully today we can work on the actual map and the actual like uh, getting spots onto the page and stuff like that. Yeah, it's not <laughs> it's not enough time to catch up. I think last week we really just worked on cookies, getting cookies and session set, and then getting that that login drop down working. So you didn't you didn't miss much. It took us like a while to do that, anyways. But that's gonna be over on Twitch. So be sure to follow, tune in on Twitch. I'll be live there in less than eight minutes. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for all the questions. Um, uh, if you enjoyed this, feel free to click that thanks button or click that subscribe button down below. And uh, yeah, we'll see you over on Twitch. Um, I think I can pin this message. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, have a good one, everyone. Hope to see you on Twitch. And uh, that's it. That's all. Wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night. We'll see you on Twitch. Here's this. Yeah.